Welcome to our visitors. If you are visiting us for the first time today, we would like to invite you to our guest zone at the back of the church straight after the service. There you will have the opportunity to connect with some of our church members and collect a small gift. Tons of things happen in our lives every day. And in a 24-hour period, we ask ourselves so many different questions. Like, what should I eat? What should I wear? Or who should I hang out with? Sometimes we ask bigger questions. Like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Who will I marry? Or where will I live? But every once in a while, we ask ourselves those even bigger questions. Questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? And is there more to life than this? The reality is, there aren't a lot of places we can go to explore life's biggest questions. So, on Alpha, we want to create a space where we can talk about those kind of questions in a way that's open and honest. In each one of our hearts, it's like we have a happiness bucket that we're constantly trying to fill. It can sound like this. If I just had uh, more money or nicer clothes or a new girlfriend, then I'd be happy. The nights would come and the girls would be gone. Like, they'd be just me, you know, me and I guess God, right? And I'm like, okay, there's definitely more to life than this. Like, I just want, I want, I want, I want, and you don't get anything. There's this deeper, even spiritual hunger that we're all trying to satisfy. You have approximately 570,000 hours left to live. And we want to invite you to spend less than 24 of them with us on Alpha. If you're between the ages of 13 and 19, join us for Youth Alpha in the third term. Sign up now. We value giving to God as an act of worship. It is not our custom to pass offering bowls around during the service. We do, however, want to encourage you to bring your tithes and offerings to God by using either the large offering bowls at the front of the church or the boxes located at the center of the building. There is also a collection box in the foyer for your convenience. You may also use online banking, but please use your type number or your name and surname as a reference when depositing. Charles is available to assist if you have any questions. Father, we welcome you in this place today. Despite all the distractions of this life, we say that we are totally surrendered and focused on you right now. Totally focused on you and you alone. That is why we're here. And so we just want you to come and touch us. You are welcome here today, Father. So come. Come have your way in us, in our hearts, in our lives. 
come, Father. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see those of you who are here <laughs> so far. So won't you take 15 seconds and greet someone that's not next to you and welcome them to the family. Prepare yourself to worship.
your children. These children. You give me Me 
orquesta You are perfect, Father, in all of your ways. And we declare that today, that you are the almighty King, and that you are good, good Father. And we believe that that is who you are. That is who you are, Father. Oh, heaven, declare the glory of the risen Lord. Who can compare with the beauty of the Lord? Forever you will be, forever you will be, heaven to the floor, the lamp upon the throne, I'll gladly bow my knee, and I'll gladly bow my knee, and worship For you today, we choose to bow the knee, to lift your name on high, to give you glory and honor, to, make, uh, to, to put you as Lord in our life and, and bow before you in every area, because you are worthy, so worthy. And you love us so much. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we say, amen. 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 amen.
Uh, now, I know, unfortunately, worship is short, has been cut short. You may be seated, sorry. Uh, has been cut short, and there's a reason for it. At 10 o'clock, the power goes out, so we need to be finished by then. And I didn't hear applause. Wow. <laughs> oh, yes, I agree, yes. <laughs> uh, Okay, so what we're going to be doing this morning is we're going to be going through stuff very quickly, unfortunately. Uh, so we ask that you hang on uh, and try and keep up with us, okay? All right, we're on it. Uh, we're going to watch the notices on how, the, not the notices, the, the notice on how to use those little cups that you were given. While Hold they're busy the finding it, if you, cup there it is. And lift only the see-through film at the top. Hold the foil lid securely and pull the see-through lid back carefully to get to the wafer. Then pull back the foil lid to retrieve the juice. Hold the pre-filled communion cup and lift only the see-through film at the top. Hold the foil lid securely and pull the see-through lid back carefully to get to the wafer. Okay, that you should have it by now. Right. Uh, if you haven't learnt it by now, join me in the struggle to open them. Right, if anybody doesn't have one of these communion cups, please raise a hand uh, and our team will run around to just make sure you get them. Keep your hand up until you've got the, uh, these communion cups. This morning I want to, to just read from John chapter 6. Uh, and this is a very challenging piece of scripture because John, uh, Jesus was talking to the Jews and he was reminding them of what had happened while they were in the wilderness and God fed them with manna, right? So that's the, a little bit of, of the background. And, and Jesus says this. He says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, quote unquote Jesus, uh, however, will never die because I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I offer so that the world may live is my flesh. It's not this little piece of bread. Right? Don't let anybody try and confuse you. It's not the bread. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise that person on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. And the Jews who were listening to him, all they could see, were the, all they could do was take those words at face value and say, but we're not cannibals. And they got very offended at Jesus. But we know that Jesus was talking about our spiritual life. We know he was talking about the symbolism of our breaking bread together. But it goes a bit further than that. And uh, he says, when you do this, we will be full of him. We will become like him. Our lives will be lived out like he lives his life out. Holy without sin. We identify ourselves completely with him. And as we eat this bread, uh, 
and, and drink this wine now, and we do it together, we identify ourselves with him. We shout out aloud to anybody and everybody who wants to hear, we are his, becoming like him. And so, as we take the bread and we break it, let's do it together, and we eat it together, we remember this is his body given for us, broken for us. Thank you, Father, that your love was so great that your son died for us. And then we take the wine and we say this is his blood poured out for each and every single one of us so that we may live for eternity in absolute health, physical, spiritual, emotional, mental, because we're with him. Amen. Amen. Let's drink the wine together. Lord, we do thank you that we can do this together as family. Knowing that we're in your hands and you are really caring for us. We bless you for that. Wonderful. We're not going to run the notices because we're kind of um, out of time. So I'm going to give some very quick notices, <clears throat> and I'm also going to go through my teaching this morning a little bit faster than I'd like to do, because I'd like to finish it before the lights go out, because when the lights go out, I go out. <laughs> okay, so if you want to run a small group at the back, there is a form, fill it in, and I will get onto you sometime. If you want to be part of the prophetic ministry, there's a form at the info desk, fill it in, and I'll get back to you. If you want prayer, fill it in, and we'll get back to you. And if you want to, you're a young person, you want to be part of the youth alpha, fill it in, and Ron will get back to you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, and then when you leave today, the ladies that I've spoken to will give you a little piece of paper this size, which has the questions on it that I'm going to deal with during my sermon. All right, so will you please um, turn to somebody and say, it was nice knowing you. Um, and then tighten your safety belt because you are going to come right out of your chair today, at least twice. If you don't, I'll come help you. And that doesn't mean that you've fallen asleep. It'll mean because of shock. Right, so um, you ready for it? Out of my way. I can't see Roy Bossinger through that mic. Got to be watching him all the time. Right, we are um, still in the theme of on earth as in heaven, which is our theme probably for the rest of this year, next year, and the year after. Okay, we, um, we're not changing the theme till we are changed. You do understand. And until the things that are in heaven are happening on earth, we stick on the theme. So... Um, Today we're looking at the subject of uh, vital questions for the local church. Now, 
as you've heard a number of times already in the last few weeks, that we are seeking God for renewal and revival, both in our personal lives and in the life of this church. And if you're not interested in that, may I suggest you go to a church where you can just sit and die and do nothing? Because here we're looking for revival. Okay, that's our intention. And if you really don't like it, you are going to get very upset when it hits us. Okay? This calls for a change from our side, and we have to face some very deep and serious issues. So our preaching theme is on earth as in heaven, and we've already looked briefly at these kind of subjects. Uh, what is revival? Praying for revival. Uh, what is an open heaven? The church as an alternative society. The impact of Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost and our spiritual inheritance, and so on and on and on. And remember, I've said to you that the way we're going about sharing the information in our sermons is like eating an elephant, one bite at a time. I was looking for an elephant picture that's got a couple of bites out of it yesterday, and I couldn't find one. Um, but that's the image, right? Uh, each little bite that we take is very important. So, I want to give you a little laugh, you know, just to settle you. Um, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, we have Jesus saying, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Well, this brings me to the church's response. And basically, this is how the church responds to Jesus. Don't let him in. It will change everything. That's what we're looking for. And so today I start a three-part teaching on vital questions for the local church. And I'm going to challenge us all to rethink how we do church. Because... Most of us have the wrong impression of church. And you'll find that very true. Now, I must warn you, that's why I said, fasten your safety belts. This is going to be one of the most difficult and challenging change we have faced for a long time. And it's going to affect every one of us greatly as members of this church. I want to just remind you of what George Bernard Shaw said, and we've seen this before in one of the previous sermons. Progress is impossible without change. Just tell somebody that quickly. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Don't tell anyone that, you'll get into trouble. <laughs> now, Bob Slosher, in his book, Miracle in Darien, which was written in 1979, before some of you were born, tells the fascinating story of how renewal and revival gripped an entire congregation called St. Paul's. He records what suddenly happened in the tiny suburb of Darien, Connecticut, USA, to make St. Paul's the fastest growing Anglican church in that country at that time. The Reverend Everett Terry Fulham agreed to accept a pastorship at St. Paul's on one condition, that Jesus Christ be the true head of the church. Now, Tony and I had the privilege of meeting Terry Fulham Everett Fulham was one of the speakers at the Renewal Conference held in Johannesburg in the late 70s, and so now you know how old Tony is. <laughs> and in his sessions on church life, which Tony and I attended, he presented the following challenging questions which we are going to examine carefully. Now this is where you fall out your chair. Ready? 
If Jesus were actually head of the local church, would there be any difference in the individual and corporate life of the church? What is the function of a head? Is Jesus' head supposed to direct the church? Do you believe that Jesus has a plan, a purpose, or program in mind in reference to this church? If Jesus as head of the church has a plan for your local church, would you agree that the most important thing for us is to find out what that plan is? And then the fifth question, what would be the difference, be specific, in this local church if Jesus were allowed to be head from this moment onwards? Now, because I'm a nice guy, and I don't like to upset people, I've personalized these questions for us as well. So, here's the personal version. If Jesus were actually head of my life, would there be any difference in my lifestyle? What is the function of a head? Is Jesus as head supposed to direct my life? Do I believe that Jesus has a plan, purpose, or program in mind in reference to my life? If Jesus as head of my life has a plan for my life, would I agree that the most important thing for me is to find out what that plan is? And what would be the difference, be specific, in my life if Jesus were allowed to be head from this moment onwards? Now we're going to work through these questions in a most uncomfortable way, in the next couple of weeks and months and years. And Jesus is going to restructure the church in this time. And he's going to revitalize this church. And so today, I'm only going to deal with questions one and two, both from how it applies to the local church and how it applies to the individual. So... He has the questions. If Jesus were actually head of the local church, would there be any difference in the individual and corporate life of the church? Individual, if Jesus were actually head of my life, would there be any difference in my lifestyle? So firstly, we need to settle on who owns the church. And then secondly, is Jesus head of the church? Now, we can quickly start to sort out the position of Jesus by just reflecting on a few scriptures. In Matthew 16, 18, it says this, and this is Jesus speaking. I tell you that you are Peter, and of course he was talking to Simon Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Whose church? His church, right? The word for church is ecclesia, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, one of our um, vineyard leaders has made this comment about that particular verse, and I want to read it to you. He wrote, Jesus will build his church, ecclesia, called out people, church community, as the instrument of his heavenly rule, destroying evil in all its forms here on earth. And the very government of hell itself will not be able to withstand the onslaught of God's kingdom through the church. Jesus wants to build his ecclesia as his governing body in every city, town, and village, at war with evil, enforcing Satan's defeat. The exciting thing is that he really meant it, and he is doing it. I just need to focus. I left my glasses off. Everything was out of focus. (laughs) (laughs) Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And yet we have Paul's declaration about Jesus to the Ephesian church. God has put all things under the authority of Christ, and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere 
with himself. And then Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, where Paul clearly states Jesus' headship. He writes this, he says, For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. So this is what the church looks like. The head is Jesus. The body are the members of the church. I'm going to say it once more. The head of the church, universal, local, is Jesus. And we are the members of his body. So these scriptures make it very clear that Jesus is the head of the church, right? Anybody got doubt? Then just open your Bible and look for yourself, okay? And so this means that the church belongs to Jesus and not to church leaders or church members. Which quickly interpreted means I can't tell Jesus how to run his church and the church can't tell Jesus how to run his church. Jesus runs his church. Got it? Oh, just checking. Now, because he is head of the church, he is head of every Christian, every member of the church. And that means very clearly that Jesus is the head and the leader of the church and not the pastors, not the leaders, and not any member. So if any of you were pushing to be head of the church, you haven't got a chance. You could get it right if you could do one thing die on a cross, and come back to life three days later. And you haven't got a chance. Okay, so, for the church to function, where am I now? <laughs> um, I've missed something here. For the church to function, Completely correctly, we have to follow the direction of the revealed word of God, which says Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. Finished. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead, and so he is first in everything. And we've seen that. Now, I want to go to the second part of question one, which is, um, would there be any difference in the individual and corporate life of the church? And I answer this by looking at the nature of the church. The church, as it's described in the pages of the New Testament, is a body, an organism, with Jesus as head. It's not an organization with human structures of control and leadership. The church does not have a CEO heading it up. Jesus is head of the church. So, the church has one head, and that is Jesus. And that means that the senior leader or pastor of the church is Jesus and not a human being. And so for you to say, you're the senior pastor. No, you are deluded. <laughs> There's no way I can be the senior pastor. I can never take Jesus' place. And so we do have some structure, but it's not like the world system. Now, get this straight. You've got to get this straight. The church is neither a democracy, a dictatorship, Marxist, or any other human government structure. If some of you thought, well, you know, the church is, is supposed to be democracy, forget it. You're not reading your scriptures. In fact, you might not even be born again. 
So let me explain what the church is. The church is a monarchy with a king, Jesus. More accurately speaking, it's a theocracy, which means a God monarchy, and the king is God Jesus. We heard recently the church is an alternative society to the one we're living in. Because South Africa is supposed to be a democracy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes. Hey, did I think that or do it? Um, the church is a theocracy. God is our king and he is head of the church. There is no democracy in the church. Now that should blow some of your understanding of the church already. So how does this apply to my life? Well, Paul writes in to Titus says this. To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now it's very interesting that Paul uses two words there. Jesus is Savior and Lord. Savior means deliverer. Lord means supreme authority, master, owner, ruler. Who owns you if you're a Christian? God. Who rules over your life? Jesus. Who is your master? Not your husband or your wife. Jesus. <laughs> Who is the supreme authority in your life? Jesus. Who is the supreme authority in the church you go to? Jesus. Getting it? Okay, now what's our problem? We need to do a reality check. Because many have received Jesus Christ as Savior, Deliverer, but have not surrendered to him as Lord, the supreme authority, the owner, the ruler, and master of their lives. And that's a problem in the church. And that's why the church doesn't function the way it ought to. Because we still think we have an option to do whatever we like. Not so. Come on, smile with me. We really do. I don't want to go to church on Sunday. I'm my own boss, you know. No, you're not. You don't even belong to yourself. When are you going to wake up, Christian? Just a thought. Did I say that thought or think it? You know, when you get old, things are amazing. You don't know whether you're thinking or saying it. <laughs> so how does this apply to the church, to you and to me? Well, starting with the pastoral leaders and elders, as from today, we as a leadership are determined that we'll do our very best to make sure we are functioning in future with Jesus as the head. So we're not going to make any decision unless it's made by Jesus. Jesus. I, for instance, if you came up to me and said, well, what do you think this church should be doing? I said, don't ask me, ask Jesus. Because I've resigned from trying to be the senior pastor. <laughs> you know, it's so comforting because you are his problem, not mine. Isn't that amazing? Now, that doesn't mean... I'm absconding from what God has called leaders to do, to have oversight, but it's under his headship. And as for the rest of the membership, that's a decision each one of you will have to consider. Will you submit to the head of the church or not? And the pastoral leadership cannot dictate what you must do. I can't tell you, you better submit to Jesus. It's your choice. You want to live without Jesus? Your choice. It'd be a very sad choice, but you're allowed to make it. Okay, let's move on to question two. Was that challenging enough? Oh, I just hope so. Question two, what is the function of a head? Is Jesus the head as head supposed to direct the church? And the individual, what is the function of a head? Is Jesus' head supposed to direct my life? And now to figure out the function of a head, 
we turn to the human body to see what the function of the head is. As I look across here, I am convinced every one of you has a head. I'm so glad about that. Now let's have a look at what is the head's function. Well, the head typically serves as the information processing center of the human body. Nothing happens to this body unless the processing center gives a command to the body. I cannot pick my nose <laughs> unless my head is given permission for my hand to do something like that. Immoral hand. Okay, so, the human brain is significant and complex. And the brain is made up of many parts, each with a specific and important function. Let's just think of some of the things the brain does. It controls our ability to balance, walk, talk, and eat. It helps us not to fall out of our chairs on a Sunday morning. It coordinates and regulates our breathing, our blood circulation and heart rate. It's responsible for our ability to see, hear, speak, to process and remember information, to make decisions and feel emotions. And that's not all. The brain is responsible for all creativity, behaviors, motor skills, problem solving, judgment, planning and attention. The brain also manages emotions, personality and temper. And the information from the sense organs, the nerves and the rest of the human body is relayed to the brain and the brain then responds to keep the body healthy. So the brain is a very, very important thing. So without this amazing processing center called the head, we would be a cabbage or dead. It's that simple. You see, you can lose a limb or two and still live. And if a limb loses contact with a brain, it can't function as it should. If the whole body loses connection with the head, it is paralyzed and not able to function correctly. Now, my mother died from paralysis. Her body lost contact with her brain through damage to the spinal cord in her neck. So I know what I'm talking about. I watched her die because there was no connection between the brain and the body. If there is no connection between us and Jesus, we're dead. We're walking around, zombies. We're the living dead. Now, if we lose our head and the brain stops functioning, the body dies. The controlling center that keeps the body going is gone. So when scripture refers to Jesus as the head of the body, the church, it's declaring that he is the very life directing source that keeps the church alive and healthy. Well, I had all of us in the staff meeting, very uncomfortable the other morning, because I said to the staff, uh, what did Jesus say to you this morning? My brain never stops communicating with my body. Jesus never stops communicating with his body. So what did he say to you this morning? When last did he say something to you? What's your connection like? So, what does this mean for us as the body of Christ? How does this apply to my life? Well, it's very simple. If the body loses connection with the head of the church, it suffers from paralysis and cannot carry out the function for which it was created. And so for the church to achieve its purpose and function as it should, 
It has to be connected to the head and be directed by the head. So as a church, we need to be connected and directed. John's gospel gives us another take on this, which is important as we understand our dependency on Jesus. He uses the image of Jesus as the true vine, image that Jesus taught, and us being the branches. And it really enforces our dependency on Jesus. Listen to the words. I'm the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful if you, unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. And watch his last words. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's true of the church. If we're not connected to Jesus as the head, we can do nothing. We can do religious stuff. But we're not doing his will. And that's the most important thing. And so to speak, as Jesus is head of his church, his body, we're saying that Jesus is the controlling center of the church body. And the implication is that as head, he's in charge of and ought to be directing every aspect and all the functions of his church. Do you understand that? In practice. With the head we say, hmm, makes sense. But in practice, is it actually happening? So, please note. Jesus never, 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 never delegates his function or his authority as head to any other part of the body. He remains the head in control of his church. I've never seen a human body where the head has been delegated to another part of the body. Have you? Maybe a deformed human, but not a healthy human. So, Jesus is the senior authority in the church. And I'm so glad about that. Really, I am. Because it's his church. It belongs to him. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to anyone else in this place. It's his. And so, if you want to have time with a senior pastor, I would suggest you book time with Jesus. First, hello there. And maybe it's time to take your cell phone, put it in the toilet, and flush away the junk. All the voices that you're listening to instead of the wonderful voice of Jesus. I want you to understand that as senior leader, I have limited delegated authority, simply as a person gift to the church, according to Ephesians 4.11. I'm only the leader of the staff team and elders who shepherd the church. Do you get it? I'm not the head of the church. 